All right, welcome to Hannity. Tonight we have huge, major breaking news on multiple fronts, including election results from five states. We're going to be updating the numbers as they continue to roll in. But first, a shocking breaking news report from John Solomon. It is even worse than we originally thought. Tonight we now have clear evidence that former associate deputy attorney general Bruce Orr was at the very center of the Clinton campaign's effort to influence, yeah, and rig the 2016 election, and actually by using your federal government as a tool to do this against Donald Trump. Now, this is worse than we ever thought. Now, newly declassified texts, personal memos, handwritten notes from Bruce Orr and Christopher Steele tonight are showing what is a coordinated effort between the Clinton campaign, the Obama administration, to use the infamous Clinton bought and paid for dirty dossier to drag down Donald Trump both before and after the election. We're going to have all the damning new details coming up, plus reaction. John Solomon and Freedom Caucus Chairman Mark Meadows. This is a huge breaking story. Also tonight, it must be a slow week for the Destroy Trump press as they continue to push the same old fake, phony, recycled scandal about the infamous meeting at Trump Tower. Now, we're going to call them out once again. And if you thought they couldn't get any more abusively biased, all oh, the fake news media, they rolled out longtime Trump hater Rosie O'Donnell to bash the president. We have all the lowlights. Now, plus the left's hypocrisy on full display last night, the West Hollywood City voting unanimously to remove Donald Trump's star from the Hollywood Walk of Fame, citing his disturbing treatment of women. Oh, meanwhile, Bill Cosby's star is there, Brett Ratner's star is there, Kevin Spacey's star is there, totally intact. And we'll also show you all the updates from day six of the trial of the century the 2005 tax case of Paul Manafort. By the way, an incredible exchange between Team Mueller and Judge Ellis. Apparently, Mueller's guy was in tears. Now sit tight, it's time for tonight's important breaking news opening monologue. All right, for over a year, we have been reporting accurately, and now we know more about Bruce Orr's suspicious ties to Fusion GPS. Remember, his wife, Nellie Orr, actually worked with Christopher Steele for Fusion GPS and the ones that put together the Clinton bought and paid for Russian dirty dossier. And as you know, the dossier was a campaign op research document put together by Steele himself. He doesn't stand by it. A former foreign spy full of Russian lies, full of misinformation, full of propaganda. Hillary paid for it, the DNC paid for it, all by funneling money through a law firm to Fusion GPS. And now, according to John Solomon's reporting tonight, we have clear evidence that Bruce Orr, the fourth most powerful person in the Obama Justice Department, was working hand in hand with Christopher Steele and Hillary Clinton's op research team, both before and after the election, clearly to stop President Trump from winning the election, and then after he won the election, literally destroy him with the Clinton-funded Russian lies that nobody ever verified and has now been totally debunked. Now, let's take a look at some of the most damning evidence. Look at this. July 1st, 2016, Christopher Steele reaches out to Bruce Orr. He wrote, quote, there is something separate I wanted to discuss with you informally and separately. Concerns our favorite, well, business tycoon. Now, that clear reference was to then-candidate President Trump. That was followed up on July 30th, 2016, three months before Election Day. Steele met Bruce and Nellie Orr for breakfast. Now, this was a meetup that was documented by this text, quote, great to see you and Nellie this morning, Bruce. Let's keep in touch on the substantive issues. Glenn Simpson, founder of Fusion GPS, is happy to speak to you on this if it would help. Now, just one day later, one day, anti-Trump FBI investigator Peter Strzok, he opened up the investigation into the phony claims of Trump-Russia collusion. Do you see how this is all coming together? And after the election ended, and President Trump was sworn in, which they didn't think would happen. Well, then the communication even continued. Now, on January 31st, 2017, President, now President, just sworn in, Steele texted, or, quote, just want to check you are okay, still in the situation and able to help locally as discussed, along with your bureau colleagues. 
Now, this text is actually damning for two reasons. One, it shows that Bruce Orr was, in fact, feeding the FBI steals lies, misinformation, and propaganda. And number two, it shows the FBI was breaking their own protocol, their own rules. Steele had been barred from working with the FBI in November of 2016 because of his leaking to the news media. And let's also keep in mind the major role that this steal, Clinton paid for dirty dossier, played in the FISA applications against the Trump campaign associate Carter Page. We now have proof Bruce Orr likely funneled the dossier to the FBI, a document Orr knew was op research bought and paid for by the opposing political party in an election year. And remember, just that yesterday on this program, House Intel Committee Chairman Devin Nunes, he revealed exculpatory evidence was completely omitted from the FBI's FISA applications against Carter Page. Watch this. There is exculpatory evidence that we, ha that we have seen of classified documents that need to be declassified. These were not, when I say exculpatory, exculpatory in nature, in what way? I don't mean to press you. Exculpatory in what way? In that the Carter Page FISA, when those, the judges should have been presented with this exculpatory evidence that the FBI and DOJ had. Do you see this? There you have it. This is Obama's Justice Department, part of Obama's branch, literally using your federal government your tax dollars, in this case as a weapon against the Trump campaign and then later the president of the United States, President Trump himself. They use Clinton campaign material, never verified, never corroborated, the phony Russian dossier to rig a FISA court application, lying to judges to spy on Team Trump. Then they used the very same op research that she paid for to open up a phony Russia collusion investigation into then candidate Trump. And then they leaked the contents of the dossier to the press because they wanted to influence the election in favor of Hillary Clinton against Donald Trump and lie to you, the American people. And on top of it all, the FBI, on top of Hillary paying Steele through Fusion GPS and the DNC paying him, the FBI paid him. The FBI made 11 payments to Christopher Steele. I have been saying, and now it has all come together. The biggest political corruption, abuse of power scandal in our lifetime. This should outrage every single American. I don't care what your political affiliation is. Let me say this slowly. They tried to steal in the United States of America a presidential election, and we have the evidence. In other words, they abused their power to steal an election, a presidential election. Our Justice Department has been weaponized for pure partisan political gain. We have so much on this major development. We're gonna to talk to John Solomon and Mark Meadows in just a minute. But in other news, just the latest example of why so many Americans can't trust the media. They've been missing in action on that scandal. Last night, we called them out again for hyping up yet another fake news story about the 2016 Trump Tower meeting between Don Jr. and the, quote, Russian lawyer. Oh, they met before with Fusion GPS and after with Fusion GPS. Anyway, they claim the president finally admitted to collusion. That's what you have now been hearing for days and days and days. They said there was stunning new evidence that the Trump Tower meeting was political. Okay, it ended up being about adoption. None of this is new, zero. None of this is stunning. None of this is collusion. We've known for more than a year that Donald Trump Jr. took the meeting, yeah, because like everybody else, oh, like Adam Schiff and Hillary Clinton, yeah, everybody wants, oh, op research on their political opponents. That didn't stop the media, even though we've known it for well over a year, and the president said it, from recycling a fake scandal two days in a row, or well, frankly, all weekend. Take a look. President Trump has made an about face on that much discussed meeting between his son, Don Jr., and a Russian lawyer at Trump Tower back in June 2016. The president now admitting it was all about getting information on Hillary Clinton. He is now bluntly acknowledging that a Trump Tower meeting central to the investigation was, in fact, about getting dirt on Hillary Clinton from the Russians. 
where all of a sudden now the president is confirming bluntly what it was all about. He says there was no, no violation of the law, but he, he's admitting finally what it was all about. I think we've actually entered now a very different realm because uh, we're no longer speculating. Now we actually have people essentially admitting what, what the happened. President. The, the people, yeah, the people being in this case the president mm -hmm. of the United States in word on Twitter admitting what happened. All of this phony, fake, feigned moral outrage over a non-story that the president had talked about, we've reported, they all reported over a year ago. That's why we call them the Destroy Trump press. That's why the American people don't trust you people in the media. And by the way, that's why we'll call you fake news. And if you thought the media's bias couldn't get any worse, well, think again. In order to bash President Trump, there you got fake news CNN, conspiracy TV, MSNBC, rolling out the longest known sufferer of Trump derangement syndrome ever. There she is, Rosie O'Donnell, last night, literally standing in front of the White House, leading a sing-along protest against her arch nemesis. And naturally, the media was more than happy to give her a platform so she could spew all of her hatred on national TV. Shocking. Take a look. He should not be president, and I don't believe that he's a legitimate president. I believe if it wasn't for Russia, he never would have won. They actually gave him the election. I believe that firmly, and I think a lot of people do. I believe he should be impeached. I'm sickened by Congress that doesn't call for articles of impeachment when we have so much evidence of his horrible high crimes and misdemeanors. Did they come in there and make Trump win when every single exit poll and every person in America knew for sure that Hillary Clinton was going to win? Do you think that there was anything to do with Russia or just a real big swirl for Donald Trump in these specific areas with the same exact amount of votes that were needed. We're going to stand up at the polls and let him know. And unless he goes in and has the Russians kind of fix it like he did last time in 2016, you know, we're going to see him gone. And that's what I'm waiting and hoping for. Now, Rosie's hatred for the president is widespread among all her friends in Hollywood, all the elite. Last night, the West Hollywood City Council, they voted unanimously. They're removing Donald Trump's star. Oh, how devastating. From the Hollywood Hall of or Walk of Fame, in part because of Trump's, quote, disturbing treatment of women. Okay, the move is non-binding, however, because the West Hollywood City Council has no authority over the walk. Let's take a look at the stars not targeted last night by the West Hollywood City Council. Uh, there we have Bill Cosby, recently found guilty of drugging and sexually assaulting a woman. And then you have dozens of other similar allegations levied against Bill Cosby. Oh, there he is, Kevin Spacey. Oh, yeah, he's facing tons of accusations of sexual misconduct for more than 10 people, including multiple victims who were allegedly abused in their early teens. You got Brett Ratner. He's been accused of, by multiple women of serious sexual misconduct and assault. Jeffrey Tambor, Oliver Stone, and many others. But the West Hollywood City Council is saying their vote has nothing to do with politics whatsoever. And finally, tonight, day six of the biggest trial of the century, the 2005 tax case of Paul Manafort. Well, it's come to a close, but not without a very tense moment between T. Mueller and Judge Ellis. Now, according to reports, the judge reprimanded a prosecutor in court and then accused him of tearing up. This would be Mueller's guy. And Judge Ellis repeatedly clashing from day one with members of Mueller's legal team, often questioning the relevance of, quote, the evidence or so-called evidence presented in court. Meanwhile, while the prosecution's star witness, Rick Gates, he continued his testimony from the stand. Manafort's def defense attorney, oh, they raised serious questions about the character of the star witness, including all the instances he actually, let's see, embezzled a ton of money uh, from Paul Manafort. The defense team accused Gates of using the money to fund a secret life and an affair in London. And despite all of that, the odds are definitely stacked against Paul Manafort, who currently faces a potential life sentence. This is a 2005 case. And remember what the judge said, to put the screws to Manafort, to make him sing or compose so they'll get information so they can get Trump. They started with his lifestyle. They talked about oligarchs. Uh, then we got the Mueller team guy tearing up in court and the judge ripping him, saying, look at me. I think the judge knows what's going on here. I think it's pretty obvious. But because Rod Rosenstein's mandate was so broad, and this has nothing to do with Russia, 
Nothing. Nothing to do with collusion. Nothing to do with Trump. Nothing to do with the election at all. Well, it's going. This is what Mueller gives us. Here with more details, reaction to our top story surrounding Bruce Orr's connection to Glenn Simpson, Freedom Caucus Chairman Mark Meadows. And from the Hill, it's John Solomon. John, it's your story. Let's get to the how a senior DOJ official helped Democratic researchers on the Russia case before and after the election. Yeah, Break listen, it down. I think, I think you hit it in your monologue just right, Sean. We now know that Bruce Orr was not just some ancillary figure. He was a central figure. He was the glue that connected the Democratic opposition research effort to destroy Donald Trump during the election by accusing him of having ties to Russia with the Justice Department and the FBI. And he's not just anybody. He's the deputy to the deputy attorney general. That means the same deputy attorney general, Sally Yates, who signed the FISA warrant for Carter Page. Her man is meeting outside of the FBI with the primary sources that Hillary Clinton dug up. And he's, he's coordinating. In the beginning, he's finding out what's going on. He's talking. Then when Christopher Steele is fired by the FBI, he's told, the FBI told him, you're no longer suitable as an asset to, to be a source. And you may not gather any more information under the color of the FBI. And what happens? 21 days later, Bruce Orr is gathering information for Steele and giving it to the FBI. And Pete Stroke is right there playing uh, wide receiver catching it. It's extraordinary. The FBI is violating its own rules. It's probably misleading the FISA court. The Justice Department has kept us in the dark about this for 18 months. We'll see tomorrow how good the media is. I'm going to put these documents up on the Hill website. People can go read them themselves. Let's see if the media writes as much about this as they do about the Manafort trial. Uh, yeah, the Manafort, the trial of the century over a tax case. Congressman Meadows, you have been and other Freedom Caucus members have been the ones, number one, demanding transparency, demanding subpoenas are are complied with. There's been obstruction, there's been delays, there's been phony redactions, phony claims of national security. As we now learn tonight from from this reporting of John Solomon, this is deeper, this is more corrupt, there is a bigger abuse of power, and obviously they wanted, they, the government tried their best, the highest levels of the FBI and DOJ, to defeat and then undermine a president of the United States. Tell me if that's wrong. Well, it's not wrong. And what we're seeing tonight, John's done some great reporting. And obviously, Sean, you have been on this from day one. But what we're seeing tonight is Bruce Orr, uh, who was with the Department of Justice, actually was working as a go-between between between them and the FBI. Now, what we're also seeing is we're not talking about one or two or three contacts. There was uh, over 60 different contacts made between Bruce Orr and Christopher Steele trying to get dirt and and actually sell dirt uh, on this president. And uh, we also have text so, messages now that confirm yeah. that Peter Strzok actually worked with Bruce Orr. So it's, uh, it's, it's amazing that it's taken so long for this to come out. Okay, so now we got Comey. Then you got the number two guy at the FBI. Now you got Bruce Orr, number four at Justice. Then we got all the Strzok and Page. Then we got everything else in between. How come nothing ever happens to these people? And we're back to a two. We've got Adam Schiff on on a tape, literally colluding with a Russian, thinking he's got naked pictures of Donald Trump. Is that a conspiracy? Is that collusion? Is that worse what they're claiming about Trump? And then we got Hillary paying for Russian lies, manipulating the American people, and on top of that, using it to spy on Americans. John Solomon. What? How, or, or Mark Meadows, we'll go to you for how deep does this go and when do these people ever get held accountable? Well, we know that there's two standards. One, uh, for those that are well-connected, and we're seeing that uh, as John is reporting tonight, but it goes very deep. If you start to read some of these emails and the text messages, uh, we're just now starting to uncover really how, how awful this was. You know, let's put it in context. It was July 30th, the day before the investigation started, when there was a meeting at the Mayflower that started this between Bruce Orr and Christopher Steele. All right, last word we're going to give to John Solomon tonight. And where is this going? There's more coming. The conspiracy that we're going to all be looking at in a month from now will be the one inside the Justice Department to defraud the Fisk Court, the FISA Court. I believe that's where this goes. Explain that in a little more detail. 
I think for sure the FBI was intentionally keeping this information, this contact with between or as a go-between, the flaws in the case, the stuff Devin Nunez told you last night. They were keeping, omitting exculpatory information and hiding their back channel to the Clinton campaign, and that is going to be a real problem for the FBI when this is all done. A Without a doubt. Agree. You agree. All right. We're going to follow this again tomorrow night. We're going to get more reaction. Judge Zinni Pirro, Greg Jarrett, our next. Jay Sekulow, the president's attorney. Should the president ever talk to Mueller? I say no. We'll ask him. Live from America's News Headquarters, I'm Ed Henry in Washington. The polls have now closed in Ohio, the scene tonight of a special and closely watched election. It pits Republican Troy Balderson against Democrat Danny O'Connor, a neck-and-neck -neck race for a U.S. House seat long held by the GOP. The latest poll numbers show Balderson leading by just about one percentage point with about 67%, uh, 70% of the votes in. Balderson backed by the president. He traveled to Ohio last weekend to stump for the state senator. Some analysts say this could be a test of voter sentiment before the midterms. We're following it live all night. The prosecution star witness taking the stand again in Paul Manafort's trial. Manafort's longtime associate Rick Gates testified Manafort lied on tax documents to hide foreign accounts, committed fraud. Then Manafort's defense team attacked his credibility, going after him for embezzling money from Manafort. I'm Ed Henry in Washington. We'll have news all night. Now back to Sean. All right, joining us now with more reaction to our opening monologue tonight, the author of the number one New York Times bestseller. It's called The Russian Hoax, Illicit Scheme to Clear Hillary Clinton and Frame Donald Trump. Fox News legal analyst Greg Jarrett. Oh, also with us, number one New York Times bestselling <laughs> author, Liars, Leakers, and Liberals, The Case Against the Anti-Trump Conspiracy, host of Justice, are both friends of the show, uh, Judge Jeannie Pierre. It's amazing. You guys, you're number one. He's number one. You're number one. He's number one. It's congratulations to both of you. I love you both. This new development about Bruce Orr, this is before the election. This is after the election. Christopher Steele is all over this. He's a liar. He's a leaker. And I am thinking they not only tried to steal an election, a presidential election, mm -hmm. they have tried to destroy this man with somebody they paid, who was also discredited, whose dossier was debunked, who he under oath said it was uh, raw intelligence, not true. Well, you know, what's amazing about all of this is that it fits right into uh, the plan. If you were going to write a story about what was going on in the FBI and the Department of Justice, he would be part of it. And the fact that this is out now and it took so long for it to come out. Think about how the FBI and the DOJ has been hiding everything they can. Where's the no 20 way... pages? I uh, want the 20 pages. You want the 20 pages. We all want the 20 pages. Why doesn't the president say, give me the 20 pages? Because right now the president is allowing this whole investigation to take its own course. You know, C Congress has oversight. What are they doing about it? They're doing the best they can, some of them, but some of them are not. Okay. What is the point of checks and balances, Greg? And what is the point of separation of powers? And you subpoena somebody, they, they ignore you, subpoena, and you don't hold them in contempt or impeach them. I know the Freedom Caucus has talked about it, but they're getting real pushback from Ryan and, the, the, and, and obviously the leadership. What do you mean? This is deeper than we ever thought. This is now getting so bad. I got to ask, where's Robert Mueller on this? Where is he, Craig Jarrett? Well, he's looking in the, all the wrong places. And the latest documents show that the FBI and the Department of Justice knew that the dossier was phony. They knew that Christopher Steele was a liar. He was on the FBI's payroll. He was on Hillary Clinton's payroll. He said he was desperate to stop Trump. His bias was so severe and pervasive, they should have disassociated themselves from him. After they fired him, unbelievably, they continue to use Christopher Steele in violation of FBI regulations, so they were very devious about it. They used Bruce Orr at the Department of Justice as the conduit intermediary and he fed the but FBI Bruce Orr information. And Nellie Orr and Christopher Steele, they're all meeting. And she right. is working for Fusion GPS. And so not only are they meeting before the election, and not only are these lies disseminated to the American people to steal an election, then they're meeting to give the information to Robert Mueller?
Is that what they're doing, this, Greg? You know, this is really the definition of corruption. Uh, the Department of Justice, the FBI. This uh, is really a shameful, shameful episode in James Comey's uh, legacy. And, you know, it's amazing to me that they continued to obtain information about the last year. Why? Because they were still trying to verify that dossier, which Steele himself said was unverifiable because they had used it as a fraud on the FISA court. <laughs> You know, the amazing part of it is that this guy, Christopher Steele, had been hired by the FBI. Oh, they, oh, oh, we now know 11. Paint, he was paid by Hillary. That's right. Well, Fusion GPS, but really by Hillary and the yeah, DNC. Her money, the money funneled through F Fusion D GPS as well as uh, Perkins Coy. But one of the things in the article, they talk about engaging Steele after 2016 as a confidential human source assisting in the probe. What does that tell you? That tells you that Christopher Steele may have been a spy in the Trump campaign. But even after he's fired, he's still a, a conduit he's, for information. He, but he's, it's also the bulk of every FISA application, the original application, the three subsequent applications. Let me tell you something. That application was re-upped every 90 days. It tells me that the judge who re-upped the FISA warrant was someone or multiple who, judges. Uh, well, multiple judges should have had additional evidence in addition to the unverified dossier. Every one of those judges who signed that warrant should be up in arms unless they knew that they were part of a, an illegal investigation and surveillance. Greg, would you get the last word? There was never any probable cause to launch the investigation of Donald Trump. There were no crimes to justify a criminal investigation, no intelligence that justified a counterintelligence probe. Facts were invented or exaggerated and it all appears to be a hoax to destroy No, that's called Trump. a conspiracy, and it's called Russia collusion. And all right, last question, quick answer, was, both of you. Should the president answer a single question of Mueller? Absolutely not. Mueller doesn't have the authority. He hasn't identified the crime. He hasn't identified that he can't get it from someone Greg else. Greg Jarrett, should he answer even, let's say, a written question, no. anything? Nothing whatsoever. Uh, Mueller really doesn't have the legal right to do it. And uh, Mueller has proven he cannot be trusted. He has ah. ruined the integrity of his own investigation. Right, we're three for three because I agree yes. with both, well, both of you. Congrats, both of you. Number one New York Times bestsellers. Amazing accomplishment. <laughs> when we come back, we'll ask the president's attorney, Jay Sekulow, this very question. Later, Jessica Tarloff, Jesse Waters, whose world will it be? As Hannity continues. All right, so will President Trump, should President Trump sit down for an interview with the special counsel, Robert Mueller? Joining us now with Reaction, President Trump's attorney, Jay Sekulow. Jay, great to see you. Um, I Good just asked you, the very same question of Greg Jarrett and Judge Pirro and every other attorney, Joe DeGeneva, I've talked to, almost every attorney is yep. universal in saying, absolutely not. Can you give us an update? Sure. Well, the first thing is, look, you, you've got to start with this proposition. The depth of corruption that led to this investigation and that, frankly, continues uh, to permeate this investigation is unprecedented. So you have to start with that. You mentioned uh, in the earlier segment the irregularities, and that's being kind, of what took place here. So you have to start with the question of whether the president would sit uh, for an interview with the proposition, is there a constitutional basis upon which that interview can take place? Now, it, frankly, it is the position of the legal team, and it's been uh, pretty clear on this in the last couple of weeks, that our position is that there is not a constitutional basis to move an interview forward. And what I mean by that is the Article II power of the presidency is very clear. And the idea that you would have a series of questions involving the president's motives uh, for particular actions as it relates to Article II power would frankly be inappropriate in our view, unconstitutional. So you ask yourself, does that answer the question? Well, look, the president has stated that he wants to do an interview. I will tell you the position of the legal team is that we do not advise that. However, there continues to be ongoing discussions and dialogue with the Office of Special Counsel to see if there is something that can be worked out that we would be comfortable with. Short of that, the answer, of course, is no. But if 
ultimately the one that makes that determination, though, the lawyers can advise, is the president of the United States. So he will make that decision, obviously, in consultation with his legal team. But Jay, you're, I, I know includes, you as an attorney, yeah, yeah. And, and by the way, and yeah. you've been my counsel. Yeah. But my yes. question, if you told me absolutely not, I don't think you would appreciate or accept me saying I'm going to do it anyway. That's my, I, you know, I've known yeah, you for uh, 20 yeah, years. You know what, though? I understand that, Sean, but you're not the president of the United States. So it's, there's a different calculus <laughs> yeah. that okay, goes on no there kidding. for him. We know that. Look, clearly no. our inclination, look, clearly the inclination is no. And you could, I could put 100 lawyers in the room and 100 of them are going to say that. I make a joke uh, when I'm talking to, to reporters that, you know, if we put the president up for an interview, you're going to have 12 lawyers saying, I can't believe they did it. If you don't put the president up for an interview, those same, two, those same 12 lawyers are going to say, what are they hiding? But if you look at the constitutional issues that are implicated by an, by an interview, it's very serious. It raises very serious constitutional issues that go to the heart of, as you mentioned earlier, separation of power, Article II authority. I've been saying that for a year, and nothing's changed in that regard. Ultimately, the, the decision's up to the president. We will give advice, but there are ongoing discussions to see if there could be some, Jay, if, something uh, worked out here. I look yeah. at the team that Mueller's put together. The president has tweeted yeah. about the team he's put together. I look at Andrew Weissman's yep. atrocious record, including, oh, let's see, putting innocent people in jail, overturn 9-0 in the Supreme Court, overturn 5-4 in, uh, overturn in the Fifth Circuit, tens of thousands of people lose their job, withholding exculpatory evidence. Now, I'm not trying to drag you into that, that, that battle, but I, I've got to ask well, you, is it uh, a pro, it's about, a, the two questions would be about obstruction and collusion. There's no evidence of collusion. Can we compare what they're accusing the president of with Adam Schiff's tape, where he's like, you know, excited because he's talking to a Russian that has dirt on Donald Trump, supposedly, turns out to be a hoax? Is it collusion? Yeah. Hillary paid for Russian lies before the election? And it was used to get well, well, there's, there's, two, there's two things here. First of all, I, I think we got to be clear on this. This idea that there's been no evidence put forward on any type of collusion uh, between the president and, and, and Russians. I, I mean, no one's put evidence forward on that. Now, that's number one. Number two, uh, let me tell you this. When people say the word obstruction, I, I want everybody to understand the context in which this is arising. This is arising in decisions that a president makes under his authority under Article 2. Who's going to work for him? Who's not going to work for him? Where things are developed, where they're not? what policy positions they take, what policy positions they do not. The idea that that would constitute some kind of violation of the law to me seems uh, not only a bizarre legal theory uh, and untested, but frankly out of order under our Constitution. But let's go back. You're using these examples uh, of, of the people involved in the investigation on the legal team. Let's go to what started this investigation in the first place. You had an unverified dossier put together by uh, Christopher Steele, who ends up getting fired by the FBI for linking. James Comey wants a special counsel, so he leaks a memo that he created based on a conversation that he had with the president. Now, if an FBI agent did that, could you imagine the repercussions of leaking that memo? Then it gets even better. You've got the number four at the United States Department of Justice, I know you've already talked about this, Bruce Orr, whose wife is working for Fusion GPS, Nellie Orr. And what is her job? Her job is to work with Christopher Seale, the former British intelligence officer, who's putting together the dossier against the president. Now, you know what? The fact is, no one could, it's hard to believe that those are really the facts. You know what the problem is, Sean? Those are the facts. And really, no one has disputed any of those facts. So the problem here is a foundational problem. That's why I say the irregularities and the, and the corruption involved in the process from the beginning is really unprecedented. So all of that factors into the decision that's ultimately made whether there'll be an interview or this. not, or whether it'll be written questions or not. That decision, we're close to making that decision. I don't ever give dates. Um, How is uh, this so going to end? Tell you when this, is though, this going to end? Yeah. I think it ends uh, soon. Uh, I cannot give you the date because here's what happens. Let me give you the process. Uh, Bob Mueller, under his authority, will issue a report. That report, though, does not go to the Congress. This is not an ind independent counsel. It would go to the deputy attorney general, who's the acting attorney general, and then he will determine what goes forward. At the same time, quite frankly, we are developing a report uh, that is going to lay out all of these issues that we've talked about. So that's how this is not a trial. And people need a, I, I think people understand that. Now, this is not a trial in the traditional sense of anything. This is a political process that is going forward. And I, I want to be clear here. The constitutional issues 
which is the reason I got it, was involved in this case in the first place, uh, in fact, are the major issues that this issue that this investigation turns on. There are serious constitutional implications of this, not just for this president, but for the presidency. And that's what history will remember. So that's why we've got to be very careful and very direct on how we move forward. Let me ask you one last question, if I may. Yeah. The president has the power to declassify all of the subpoenaed documents that Congress has been withholding. And they've, been not, they've not been living up to the subpoenas. I, I, I don't think I'd get away with that, even with you as my great attorney. Yeah. The president yeah. has the power to demand they be literally unredacted and released. Why doesn't he do that? Well, look, he's, he's, res he's respecting a process that's in place that his White House team, that is not a decision we make as his private lawyers, as, his, uh, as counsel of the president. We are not the White House counsel. So that's a decision that's made within the context of the White House and their purview. That decision, I'm sure, is being discussed and the issues are being discussed. So I'm not going to defend what, is, what has or has not happened there because that's outside of our jurisdiction. Needless to say, and I, I think this is fair to say, and the American people are asking for this, transparency is important here. And I think one of the aspects of transparency is what are in these documents. And if it doesn't put our national security at risk, uh, I would think that it should be something that should be uh, released and declassified. But you know what? I said you're not the president. I'm not the president either. I don't get to make those decisions. What about Bruce Orr and this relationship mm. with Nellie Still Orr, at the Department Bruce of Orr and Christopher Steele? And the FBI was paying? Christopher yeah. Steele? Ah, well, look, they fired they fired Chris Steele because he's leaking information, leaking which seems to lying. be an ongoing uh, scenario. And and but yet they're still have, Bruce Orr is still having conversations with him, and they're, you've, you've seen the the most recent uh, pieces that have been uh, posted by John Solomon and others. I mean, the fact of the matter is that when you look at this in its totality of circumstances, if Sean, it, it boggles the mind that this is this is not a regular investigation. This is irregular. I said the, the corruption at the outset of this uh, has just been unprecedented. I think the American people are seeing that for what it is. All right. When we come back, Jesse, Jessica on Rosie O'Donnell's unhinged comments and more as we continue. His news headquarters. I'm Ed Henry again in Washington. We have a major story breaking in Ohio. We continue to keep a very close eye on this special election in the Columbus area of Ohio. It pits Republican Troy Balderson against Democrat Danny O'Connor. A neck and neck race. We knew it was going to be close for this U.S. House seat long held by the Republicans. It's even closer than we thought. The latest numbers show the two candidates tied basically at 49.7 percent each with 85 percent of the votes in. But the Democrat has uh, well, it's just changed in the last moment. The Democrat had a slight edge by about 155 votes. Right now, with 89% in, Troy Balderson, the Republican, is up by 0.6 percentage points, or essentially about 1,000 votes. So clearly, some of the latest votes coming in are from a county that favors Republicans. Some political analysts say that this will be a, a big test, obviously, of the president's coattails. He was there this weekend. Back to Sean. until he's out. Let the president know in no uncertain terms that we are alive, awake, and we are woke. We are not going away. Good silent people are the wind behind evil. Mm. Rosie O'Donnell, protest outside the White House last night. The president wasn't there. Joining us now, it's his world. We live in it. He actually has two shows. It's ridiculous. He's Jesse and Brian Kilmeade on TV 24-7. Uh, anyway, Waters World, co-host of the hit show, The Five. Jesse Waters, Fox News contributor, Jessica Tarlov, who's... You can't, not yet. I, I didn't say it. I said, whose world I'm, is it It's gonna... a foregone conclusion. Listen, you know what? Unfortunately, I think I'm that's gonna, true. I'm going to surprise you. You can have Rosie. You can have Maxine Waters. You can have all the people screaming for impeachment. Oh, oh, oh what was the name of the, the Nut Roots thing that they have? And yeah, Nut Roots Nation. Not, Nut Roots Nation. And, and they had Marcus Polito said, don't run from the word socialist. If you do, we're not supporting you. I'm all in favor. Nancy Pelosi, too. I'm supporting all of them. You've Keep named talking. a very diverse list of characters there. I would separate out the sitting Congresswomen from Rosie O'Donnell. First of all, that's no, no, no. a celebrity. Well, my, uh, listen, Maxine I'm saying some win. people I'll keep and cool. some people won't. Well, Maxine, keep. You know, yeah. Nancy Pelosi, you're sitting Congresswoman. You keep who Hollywood, I will keep the heartland. How's that? 
<laughs> you guys would love trip? it. You would love it if Hollywood had any interest in you. But when they do, you only get Scott Baio, Ted Nugent, Roseanne Barr. You know, the only celebrity Trump needs is Trump. He's got more talent than any of these people. He fills up huge stadiums, hit TV shows. His apartment is much bigger that, right? than any of theirs. His apartment actually, is bigger? The only celebrity that's actually moving the needle is Kanye, and he's moving it for Trump. I think black support for the president doubled, went from 15 to 29. I did see that in, the, in that no, no, no. famous From 8 game. to 29. 8 to 29. Oh, I, I, eight I thought it was 15 to oh, 29. And by the way, it's the lowest disparity in terms of job percentage ever, and this came out in Bloomberg today. Huge news in terms of when you break it down demographically, African Americans. And and others. This is great news for it is great news the minority for the economy. community. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Go ahead. Look in the camera. Say thank you, Donald. Thank you, President. Thank you, Trump. Donald. But thank you, Barack Moore. <laughs> oh, Barack. Where did that trend Wait, line start? Say that Who did Trump it start was with? Crash the economy. Actually, I didn't. So then I ran away the from that Paul well, Krugman article. For it? No, there were great circumstances that he inherited, and he has done a good job working with what he got to begin with and we'll see what happens the tariffs are okay. hurting a lot of people he got 13 million more americans food stamps 8 million more in poverty they were 15 recovery. million insured Worth, 12 million new jobs oh, yeah, that obamacare is working out so well <laughs> oh really it's the number one issue in the country and democrats are winning on it everywhere where have democrats won what? New Jersey, oh, blah, Virginia. Blah. You guys are so They're, far out of power, the 1930s called. That's absolutely not true. Yeah. <laughs> you guys have never that. had less power since the 1930s. Inaccurate. Guess whose world it is today. <laughs> whatever. What, what do you mean, whatever? I mean, like, whatever at this point. I think I well, did What do you really mean, whatever time. at this point? Guess well, whose world it is. Who do you think won It time? was total hyperbole, first of all. Who I do you came think here won? with the facts. I listed the celebrities that you have. Did I Excuse mention me? Duck Dynasty? Right, ready? And you, I got what? And you have Jim Carrey, by the way. He draws a beautiful picture. Oh, you think yeah. that's beautiful? <laughs> wow, she lost hard. <laughs> oh, God. It's his world. All right. You're living in it. Go ahead. Say goodbye. Good All right, when we come back, a really touching video of an American hero. A well, Massachusetts police officer made his final radio call after over 30 years on the job, but he got a surprise when he heard a familiar voice on the other end of the radio. Watch. Everyone I've served with, and to my boys. Time to go home. Just, it's time to go home. Thank you. On this day, after 32 and a half years of service, my father, Southbridge Police Officer Dwayne Ledoux, is retiring and has given his final Code 5. It is my honor to acknowledge this Code 5, to set free a man who has sacrificed so much of time for all of us, so, he, so that he may spend the rest of his life discovering new craft beer, exploring this beautiful country, and most important of all, Chasing glory. Officer Adu, badge number 1041. Dad, you are officially code five. Love you. His son calls after 30 years. Thank you for your service. All the cops every day put their lives on the line for us. All right, that's all the time we have left this evening. As always, thank you for being with us. We will always be fair and balanced, but not to destroy Trump media. Let not your heart be troubled. There she is. Laura Ingraham, take it away.